The social contract between Maya kings and their subjects was that through special knowledge and ritual, the rulers would keep earth in tune with heaven, ensuring good harvests and prosperity. They succeeded too well. By the height of the late classic period in the 8th century AD, rural populations were as dense as those in pre-industrial Southeast Asia. The Tikal kingdom alone may have held half a million people, depending on how its boundaries are defined. The other states, a dozen important ones and perhaps 50 more, were much smaller and seem to have been arranged in shifting alliances rather like modern nations. Most Maya lived on the land in farmsteads, but even far from a city, they numbered up to 500 people a square mile on good land. It used to be a mystery how the fragile ecology of a tropical rainforest, believed to have been cultivated by Sweden or Slash and Burn, could support such densities. It's now known that the Maya practiced intensive farming in swamps by a method called raised fields, cutting networks of canals and ditches to drain the land in the rainy season and water it in the dry. Fish were kept in these canals, whose dredgings were used as fertilizer, along with compost and sewage. As the Victorians in India coyly put it, Maya fields were self-manuring. Maya towns, like most small societies, had been communitarian at first, but a familiar social pyramid rose up with the pyramids of stone, and nature, of course, had to carry it all. Studies of ancient pollen confirm that as the cities grew, the jungle died by the stone axe. Cornfields spread and trees dwindled, with a corresponding decline in game, the Maya's chief source of protein, apart from fish, turkeys, and an occasional hairless dog. By the middle of the classic period, only the upper class was eating much meat in the larger states. Each city had its distinctive style. Copan produced intricate sculpture. The statues of its kings, compared by Aldous Huxley to Chinese ivories, radiating order and refinement. Palenque's palaces were light and imaginative, embellished with bas-relief panels and finely modeled stucco. Tikal became a massive vertical place, its central buildings the tallest in the Americas until the late 19th century, a Manhattan of Art Deco towers. The resemblance isn't fanciful. Maya architecture influenced modern styles, especially early skyscraper forms and the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. Now that Maya inscriptions can be read, they have dispelled old notions of classic period life as lofty and serene. For all the grand explorations of cosmic time, public texts are also royal propaganda, proclaiming births, accessions, deaths, victories, and coup d'etat. During the eighth century, as trouble begins to brew, these statements become more strident, betraying a scramble for power and resources in a shrinking world. Militarism takes hold, old alliances break down, dynasties become unstable. The ruling class exalts itself with extravagant building projects. The city of Tikal was built up over 1,500 years, but all the high towers that still watch over the forest went up in the city's final century, costly blooms on the eve of collapse. When the great cities wobbled, upstarts began to assert themselves, as in Greece during the Peloponnesian Wars. At the Maya town of Dos Pilas, which made a futile bid for power in the mid-8th century, diggings have unearthed a glimpse of the last days. People huddling in the central square, tearing stone from the temples to throw up barricades. Equally poignant are the wall paintings at the small city of Bonampak, which commissioned a set of frescoes to record a great victory in the 790s. The battle scene, drawn by a master, is among the liveliest and most skillful in ancient art. Afterwards, prisoners are displayed bleeding on the temple steps, along with a musical parade and scenes of royal women presenting the kingdom with an air. It is all so nouveau riche and so brief. The paintings were never finished. The caption blocks stayed unfilled, a silence more truthful than anything they might have told. One by one, the cities fell still, inscribing no more monuments. 
until on January the 18th, 909, in the Maya system, 10-4-0-0-0. The last date was carved, and the great machinery of the long count calendar ceased to revolve. So what went wrong? As in Rome, all the usual suspects, war, drought, disease, soil exhaustion, invasion, trade disruption, peasant revolt, have been questioned. Some of these are too sudden to account for a collapse that took more than a century. But many of these things would flow from ecological malaise. Again, sediment studies show widespread erosion. There are no goats to blame in this case, but small losses each year still added up to bankruptcy. Stone axes are slower than steel, and hoes gentler than plows, but enough of them will do the same job in the end. The fertility of a rainforest is mainly in the trees. Modern clearing in Amazonia shows that tropical loam can be destroyed in a few years. The Maya understood their soils and conserved them better than today's chainsaw settlers do, but eventually demand overtook supply. David Webster, who has excavated at several major sites and written a recent book on the Maya fall, says this about the greatest of the city-states. The most convincing collapse explanation we have for the Tikal Kingdom is overpopulation and agrarian failure with all of their attendant political consequences. Webster's conclusion holds for most of the central lowlands. The ornate Maya city of Copan, which stands in a Honduran valley surrounded by steep hills, fell into a common trap, one that is costing millions of acres around the world today. The city began as a small village on good bottom land beside a river, a rational and harmless settlement pattern at first. But as it grew, it paved over more and more of its best land. Farmers were driven up onto fragile hillside soils whose anchoring timber had been cleared. As the city died, so much silt washed down that whole houses and streets were buried. Human bones from classic sites show a growing divide between rich and poor, the wealthy getting taller and heavier while the peasants became stunted. Towards the end, all classes seem to have suffered a general decline in health and life expectancy. If we had Maya mummies to examine, we would probably find them riddled with parasites and the ills of malnutrition, like ancient Egyptians. Webster believes that at the height of Copan's magnificence, during the long reign of King Yashpasach. Life expectancy was short, mortality was high, people were often sick, malnourished, and decrepit looking. House remains show that in a century and a half, Copan's population had shot up from about 5,000 to 28,000, peaking in AD 800. It stayed high for one century, then fell by half in 50 years, then dropped to nearly nothing by A.D. 1200. We can't attribute these figures to mass migration in or out, for much the same pattern occurs throughout the Maya area. The graph, Webster observes, closely resembles the kind of boom and bust cycle associated with wild animal populations. He might also have compared it to something more immediate. Copan's five-fold surge in just one century and a half is exactly the same rate of increase as the modern world's leap from 1.2 billion in 1850 to 6 billion in 2000. Some scholars attribute the Maya fall to a severe drought early in the ninth century, a Maya dust bowl. Yet collapse in several areas had already begun by then. During their peak in the eighth century, the great cities of the Maya heartland were running at the limit. They had cashed in all their natural capital. The forest was cut, the fields worn out, the population too high, and the building boom made matters worse, taking more land and timber. Their situation was unstable, vulnerable to any downturn in natural systems. A drought, even if it was no worse than others the Maya had weathered before, would have been more of a finishing blow than a cause. As the crisis gathered, the response of the rulers was not to seek a new course, to cut back on royal and military expenditures, to put effort into land reclamation through terracing, or to encourage birth control, methods of which the Maya may have known. No, 
They dug in their heels and carried on doing what they had always done, only more so. Their solution was higher pyramids, more power to the kings, harder work for the masses, more foreign wars. In modern terms, the Maya elite became extremists or ultra-conservatives, squeezing the last drops of profit from nature and humanity. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Alumni Theater at the University of King's College in Halifax, you're listening to Pyramid Schemes, the fourth of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. Of the four cases we've looked at so far, two, Easter Island and Sumer, failed to recover because their ecologies were unable to regenerate. The other two, Rome and the Maya, collapsed heavily in their heartlands where ecological demand had been highest, but left remnant societies whose descendants have come down to modern times. During a thousand years of low population, the land in both places managed to recover, helped by volcanic ash falls and pandemics. Italy is no Easter Island, and Guatemala is no Sumer. There's a riddle here. Why, if civilizations so often destroy themselves, has the overall experiment of civilization done so well? If Rome couldn't feed itself in the long run, how is it possible that for every person on Earth in Roman times, there are 30 here today? Natural regeneration and human migration are part of the answer. Ancient civilizations were local, feeding on particular ecologies. As one fell, another would be rising elsewhere. Large tracts of the planet were still very lightly settled. A fast film of the Earth from space would show civilizations breaking out like forest fires in one region after another. Some were isolated and spontaneous. Others were carried from place to place across the centuries, sparks on the cultural wind. A few flared a second time in a good place after a long fallow, rekindling from old coals. A second answer is that while most civilizations have outrun natural limits and collapsed within a thousand years or so, not all have. Egypt and China were able to keep burning without using up their natural fuel for more than 3,000 years. What made them different? Egypt, as Herodotus wrote, was the gift of the Nile. Her fields watered and her soils refreshed each year by a layer of flood-borne silt. Desert hills hemming the river on both sides showed from the start what the limits of tillage would be. There were no wooded slopes or jungles to tempt a population boom on fleeting soils. The Nile and its delta offered only 15,000 square miles of cropland, an area the size of Holland drawn out in the shape of a lotus with its head touching the sea. Egypt's farming methods were simple as conservative as the culture itself, working with rather than against the natural water cycle. The Nile Valley's narrowness and drainage slowed the salt buildup that poisoned Sumer. And unlike the Maya and ourselves, ancient Egyptians generally knew better than to build on farmland. Egypt's population growth was also unusually slow. Throughout the Pharaonic, Roman, and Arabic periods, it stayed well below world average taking 3,000 years to rise from below 2 million to about 6 million by Cleopatra's time, and rising no further until the 19th century when modern irrigation began. This tells us that 6 million people, or 400 per square mile of farmland, was the carrying capacity of the Nile ecosystem, a limit grimly enforced by famine when the river faltered and by high levels of waterborne disease. Nature made Egypt live within its means. But Egypt's means were those of a remittance man, topped up each year by the Nile at the expense of other farming peoples upstream in the Ethiopian highlands. 